Good morning, everybody. Hey, uh, it is great to have uh, the kids with us this morning, leading us. Appreciate, uh, yeah, praise the Lord for that. Appreciate Tobias poking at people this morning as we opened the service. God bless you, bro, I like that. Yeah, if you're still at home, I hope you're not asleep in bed or something like that, he said. That was, a, that was awesome. So, uh, okay, anyway, so uh, kids, you guys are dismissed. If you're in the elementary grades, you're out. And the youth, junior high and high school, I think Pastor Chris is going to keep you guys in today, which is just as well, because this morning's text is one of the most important texts, arguably, in the entire Bible. And it's a text... I'm convinced that uh, Satan does not want taught this morning. Uh, I will say, if you're watching us on the stream, if we actually are streaming, uh, that's only by the grace of God, because we've had more than our share of technical problems this morning. We've had people call in sick at the last minute. We've had microphones, half the microphones randomly stop working during sound check. Uh, all of this, I know, we have a very real enemy, and all of this is, uh, I know, potentially spiritual warfare, just trying to keep God's word from going out, uh, and we're not going to let that happen, amen? So uh, let's pray and just ask God's gracious hand to be over all of these kinds of crazy details uh, as we dive into, like I said, what is a super important uh, text in God's word, so... Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, and we thank you, Lord, that by your grace we are here, Lord. We thank you, um, Lord, that you would just place your gracious hand over all of the details of our service today, Lord, of the stream as it goes out. Lord, bless all those people who continue to join us uh, from home, Lord, from uh, faraway places, Lord. We're blessed to have them as part of our Calvary Chapel Mountain View family, Lord. And we pray that you would do a work within each of our hearts this morning uh, through your word. Lord, we pray that that teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest today, Lord. Give us understanding, we pray, Lord. Help us to know your heart, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Revelation chapter 20 this morning. Revelation chapter 20. We are in the home stretch of this book. And as I said, today's text is a very important text. Uh, it's also a very misunderstood text. It's a much debated text, but it is also, well, without question, it is a wonderful text because in it, we see history unfolding for us uh, in advance. It's the end, actually, of the history of this world as we know it. Uh, and knowing the things that this book reveals to us, it really allows us, I think, to have peace in the midst of all of the craziness that we see going on in the world all around us. Um, to know, uh, as I've titled the message today, that there are some great things that are ahead. There are great things in store for this troubled world. And you remember what a glorious chapter we looked at last week as the tribulation period, that seven-year period, uh, sort of came to an end. And we saw the spotlight then sort of shift back to the focus on the glory of heaven. We saw the second coming of Jesus Christ. We saw us as the armies of heaven riding in right behind him. We saw all of heaven rejoicing, remember, at the justice, at the judgments of God upon the destruction of those wicked world systems, right? Religious Babylon, commercial Babylon, those systems that have plagued mankind and drawn so many away from the Lord. And then finally, remember, at the end of our text last time, we watched the defeat of the world's armies. Remember, they were gathered there together at that final battle of Armageddon, uh, gathered by the Antichrist to fight one another, but ultimately they're going to unite in opposition against the Lord Jesus. And we saw that they're going to be wiped out with simply a word from his mouth. Remember, the text gave us this kind of picture of their bodies becoming a feast for these scavenger birds, which were called 
to come. And finally, we saw the Antichrist, we saw the false prophet, these two figures who will lead so many millions during that last seven-year period, lead them literally to their destruction and their own damnation. They themselves were saved from that battle only to be cast alive into the lake of fire. And we said that they had become the first participants, really, in that eternal torment of hell. So that's where we pick up this morning, right? So we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 20. Now we're going to see our greatest enemy defeated. It says in verse 1, It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, remember we saw back in chapter 12, we saw that Satan, after that great battle in heaven, that Satan had been cast out of heaven. Now, here we see him cast from the face of the earth and confined, at least temporarily, in the bottomless pit. Remember, this is the abyss, right? The abuso, which we've seen before back in chapter 9. It's not the same thing as Hades, which is the realm of the dead, but it's somewhere seemingly right near the center of the earth, and it's the prison of demons, and now we see it holds its most infamous prisoner. And you notice there in verse 2, the Holy Spirit, writing through John, uses four different names to describe Satan. And each one of them communicates something different about his wicked work in the world. First, he's called the dragon, right? Speaking of, of course, his cruelty and his viciousness and the danger that he is to everyone everywhere. He's called the serpent of old, which takes us right back to the Garden of Eden and the fall of Adam and Eve, where the serpent, remember, came in with such great subtlety and with great cunning, just the way that he comes in to our lives today. Understand, the devil never comes on the scene or into your life and says, hey, I'm the devil. You know, hey, if you've got five minutes, I can destroy your life, right? He just doesn't, he doesn't operate that way. But he always hides the fact that he is this dragon. He keeps that well tucked away. So we have to be very, very careful about the different ways that he presents himself. He's called the devil. We talked about the fact that that was from the Greek word diablos, which means the accuser. And remember we saw back in chapter 12, he was described as the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night. So that's what he does, even now, right? He has this very special skill about accusing and about condemning people, especially accusing and condemning us as Christians. Now, thankfully, as we saw in chapter 12, we have this incredible defense attorney in the person of Jesus Christ. And none of these accusations that Satan can make against us will ever stick to us because of that work that Jesus has done for us on the cross. Finally here we see that he's called Satan. Satan literally means adversary, right? He is always fighting against us. We are in a warfare. And so we need to be aware and we need to be prepared for this. Peter talks about, he warns us to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so I think of this name, Satan, it's kind of a full encapsulation, if you will, of what the devil is and what the devil has been all throughout human history. He has been all of these things for thousands and thousands of years. But now, at this point, for the next thousand years, All of that is going to be put to a stop in human history. 
the world is going to get a thousand year break from his lies and from his cruelty and from his condemnation, from his accusations, from his slander, from his temptations, all of that is going to come to a halt. And yet we might wonder, why only for a thousand years? But we're going to see that God still has one more task for his unwilling servant, Satan, to perform. And we're going to see that as our text unfolds. But I want us to notice one thing before we move on. Notice who it was that John says came down and bound Satan and threw him into that pit. Notice it wasn't the Lord himself. It wasn't a huge army of angels. It wasn't even Michael, the mighty archangel. Notice that it was just one single unnamed angel. It doesn't even say that he was a big angel. He wasn't even a great angel or a strong angel. And we've seen some pretty great and strong angels, right? But this was just some rank and file angel who easily overcomes Satan, almost like he's just like checking off a chore on his to-do list. And he could do that because it was God who sent him to overcome Satan. And the point of all this is that sometimes I think we imagine that there's this huge cosmic struggle going on around us between God and between Satan. Some kind of a, a struggle for power and control and that somehow sometimes the outcome is kind of hanging in the balance. Like it's a little bit touch and go, but we hope God's gonna eke out a win right in the fourth quarter or, or whatever it is. But that is simply not the case. Understand, Satan is not the evil equal to God. Satan is nothing more than simply a created being who is even now serving the Lord in the midst of his rebellion. It is God who is in control. And Satan operates only as he is allowed to operate by God. And only until he's allowed to operate no more. And so here now, effectively, God has taken care of all of his enemies, and the Lord is now ready to establish this righteous kingdom on earth. Look in verses 4 through 6. We're going to see this great coming kingdom. In verse 4, John writes, he says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So these verses begin this coming period in history that's known as the millennium. Millennium simply in Latin means a thousand years, right? So this is the thousand year kingdom of Christ on the earth. And it is a literal kingdom on the literal earth lasting for literally 1,000 years with Jesus Christ literally ruling righteously and us assisting him literally. Now, as you can see, I am making a big deal of this literally, right? because there are those who believe that this thousand-year kingdom is not a literal kingdom, but simply a spiritual kingdom. And what they prefer to do is sort of spiritualize all of these Old Testament prophecies and apply them to the New Testament church today. They take all of those prophecies about the coming promises and the blessings and the prosperity and the wealth which belong to God's people Israel and they're fulfilled during this coming thousand year period and they mistakenly apply all of those prophecies to the church. 
Therefore, they claim that we are in the millennial kingdom right now. Now, I don't know about you, but as I look around, I don't see that this much looks much like Jesus is ruling righteously on this planet. This right now doesn't look much like the kingdom that he has been waiting to come and set up. It certainly doesn't look to me like Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. You might have heard the old expression. It says, if Satan is bound today, then his chain is way too long. Amen? <laughs> Here's what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah that this kingdom would actually look like. And just see if this sounds like the world that we live in today. In Isaiah 11, starting in verse 6, he said that the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the prophets describe this time as a time of unprecedented peace. And not only unprecedented peace between animals and humans, but a time of unprecedented peace between humans and humans. Prophet Micah says, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. Imagine that. No fear of anything. No wars, no crime, no corruption, no need for law enforcement or for military. There will be no oppression of anyone by anyone. Isaiah chapter 2 tells us that people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So it's going to be a time of plenty and a time of prosperity. No famine, no hunger, no disease, no sickness, not even any death. It's going to be a time when Jesus, as I said, will fulfill all of those unfulfilled prophecies that he made to Israel. Prophecies regarding her restoration as a nation and her restoration as a people and prophecies specifically which point to the fact that he will rule over them as their king. Imagine it, for a thousand years, mankind is going to be able to get to see what this world would look like under the control of one who is leading justly and one who is governing righteously. And the Bible talks about the conditions on the earth during the millennium as being a perfect environment, perfect spiritually as well as physically. That the earth is going to be restored, in a sense, from all of these devastating effects of the tribulation. We are going to see what this world has the potential to be, even in its fallenness. The way that it's, it has the potential to be a blessing to mankind and all of the beauty that is built into this world, that's built into the creation by its creator. It will be nothing like we can even imagine and it will certainly be nothing like we see today. But here's the good news. We don't need to just imagine it because we are going to be a part of it. And we're not simply going to be spectators, we are going to be participants. Both verse 4 and verse 6 state clearly that we will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Right, that we're going to assist Jesus in this righteous governing of his kingdom. It says there as priests of God and of Christ. Meaning that we're going to represent him before the people who remain on the earth. And John explains that anyone who was part of the first resurrection is going to share in this blessing. Now understand, the first resurrection, it's not a single point in time, the way the movies might sort of lead us to believe, but rather the Bible teaches that the first resurrection covers a period of time. And the first resurrection begins with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
which Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that Jesus is what? He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, right? He's the first to rise in the first resurrection. Then the first resurrection continues to include all of those who believe in Jesus Christ, but died before the rapture occurred, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. It also includes all of those who are believers who are alive at the time of the rapture. That's verse 17 of the same chapter. It includes all those who were martyred during the tribulation because they refused to take the mark of the beast. They're mentioned right here in verse 4. It also includes, according to Daniel, all of those Old Testament saints who believed in Jehovah, looked ahead to the coming of the Messiah, but didn't have the opportunity to be part of the church because they died even before Jesus came, and yet they died in faith. So the first resurrection speaks of anyone and everyone who has chosen to be included in God's great plan of salvation. And so if you're here this morning and you're asking, how in the world do I become part of this first resurrection? Well, it is so very, very simple. It's by trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Because at that point, you are no longer in danger of facing future judgment for your sins, but instead guaranteed to be able to partake of what John calls these blessings. So at this point, right, here as we start this thousand-year millennial kingdom of Jesus, all the saved people have been uh, raised, if you will, to reign with Jesus. While all of those who died without Jesus, they remain waiting in Hades. Look at verse 5. It says, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now we're going to see at the end of our text, they too will be resurrected, but it'll be to a resurrection, not of blessing, but a resurrection of judgment. But understand, these two resurrections will be separated literally by a thousand years. A thousand years while we are here on the earth in our glorified bodies, and we are judging with Jesus. So if you're here this morning and your friends tell you you're a little judgy, well, you got a head start on the rest of us. You're going to fit right in. Eric's shaking his head, right? He's right, because that's not actually at all what it means, right? Jesus is going to be the judge, right, with a capital J. And we are going to be judges with little j's in the sense that we are identified with him. And we are somehow going to be involved in the enforcement of his judgments. And we're each, the Bible indicates, we're each going to do it in whatever little place in the world that he is going to place each one of us based on how faithful we are today. You think about those parables that Jesus taught, the parables of the talents or the parables of the, the minas, right, or the, the minas in Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 19 about all the, how the way the servants are rewarded based on how they used the resources that were given to them. How you've used whatever resources he's given to you in whatever he's given you to do even here and now. And that doesn't mean you have to be standing up here doing what I'm doing. This is just what he happened to give me to do. But it could be that you're a mother or a father who's simply being faithful to raising your children in the Lord. You could be a teacher who's exhibiting those kinds of godly characteristics to a room full of children. You could be simply because you're a person who faithfully invests your financial resources into the work of the local church ministry. It could be that you're a person who prioritizes kingdom-building work in the way that your life is organized. All of these things are going to come into play as the Lord Jesus determines who it is that he can entrust 
with different levels of kingdom responsibility, right? Serving right there alongside him in this millennial kingdom. Now, here's a question that often comes up, and some of you super smart people, which is most of you, are probably wondering this already. If Jesus is going to rule here for a thousand years in this perfect righteousness, if everything on earth is going to be perfect, then why in the world would there need to be anyone to be the enforcers of obedience to his commandments? Why will we even need these kinds of people? Well, the answer is that because the population of the world during this kingdom age, right? In addition to all of us who have our glorified new bodies by that time, but the population of the world during the kingdom age is going to be made up of men and women who have survived through the great tribulation they were the ones that did reject the Antichrist and they didn't take his mark. They didn't join in all of that persecution against the Jews. It'll include those Jews who we read about that were, were supernaturally protected from the wrath of the Antichrist. So all, all of these people have now lived to enter into this millennial age, but they're going to do it as human beings, fallen human beings still with their fallen human sin nature, right? And they're going to continue for a thousand years to give birth to more children who will also have that very same fallen sin nature. In fact, a lot of children, right? The Bible indicates that during this thousand year kingdom that the life expectancy of humans is going to increase dramatically probably back to what it was in those pre-flood days where humans were living for more than 900 years at a time. So a whole lot of people are going to be born during that thousand years who don't necessarily have a commitment to Jesus Christ. They will certainly submit to him because they don't have any other option, but their hearts could still be in rebellion against him. It's like that story of the child whose mother tells him to sit down and he refuses. And she tells him again to sit down and he complies, only to announce to her that he's still standing up on the inside. Right? How many of us are sometimes still standing up on the inside? Right? God doesn't want us standing up on the inside, and he won't force anyone into heaven. And so what we see next is this is where, again, his servant Satan comes back again onto the scene, that one more task that God had for him to complete. Now at the end of this thousand-year reign, right, we've had this great kingdom that is to come. Now we're going to see one great final rebellion. Look at verses 7 through 10. It says, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Notice he didn't get loose. He was released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, seriously? Right? After a thousand years of perfect righteousness and of peace and of prosperity and of Jesus as the king of the earth, you are going to tell me that Satan is able to launch this one final worldwide rebellion? Yes, that is literally what I'm telling you. Actually, it's John that is telling us that, right? Because that is 
literally what is going to happen on this planet, literally. You would think that Satan would get released here and he'd come to the earth and he'd begin again to deceive the earth just like he did all the way back in the garden. And you would think that the whole world this time around would go, whoa, wait a minute, right? We know who you are. We've heard all about you. The way that you just destroy and you murder and you lie and you kill and you slander and you've done nothing but that for thousands of years in human history. There is no way we are falling into that trap again. And yet what happens is exactly the opposite. Notice it says there that a group that cannot be numbered, right? A group whose number is as the sand of the sea, that many people are going to follow him into his final rebellion against the Lord. Why? Because, as it says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Right? This is going to be proven out once again. Proven out because God is just and he's righteous and he will not force anyone to love him. Because understand that for the last thousand years, or the thousand years, I should say, of the millennium, right? No one has had a real chance to rebel against this righteous rule. So here he's going to give them this little window of opportunity, right? They're going to be given a chance to show whether they really do love the Lord Jesus and whether they want to follow him in his ways or whether they're just being forced into submission and forced into following him. Because our love for God is only meaningful if there's a capacity for choice. It's only meaningful if we have the freedom to follow him out of our own desire to do so and to, to love him out of our own hearts, or we have the choice not to do that. The choice not to follow him and the choice not to love him. And it's that very choice that makes our decision to love him and to walk with him. That's what makes it so very precious and so very valuable to him. Because we've said no to all of these other things and we've said yes to him. That's why he didn't make us robots. Right? That's why he has to allow the devil to be released this one more time. Because he doesn't want anyone with him for all of eternity who's saying, boy, I got suckered into this one. I got tricked into this whole heaven thing. I didn't want anything to do with it. But you know, he's got all the power. So I didn't really have a choice. Right, this just shows us that God will never take away an individual's right to choose to love or to choose to reject him. This battle gives them that chance. Now, just a quick note for you Bible scholars who are taking notes. Don't mistake this battle involving Gog and Magog that's mentioned there in verse 8. Don't mistake this for the same that battle that's mentioned in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Because they are two entirely different battles for a number of different reasons that we won't dive into this morning. But just understand that Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, that war centers around Russia or some sort of a superpower to the north of Israel. As well as some very, very specific named Middle Eastern Islam dominated countries that are going to come against Israel more than a thousand years earlier, prior to the millennium, probably prior to the tribulation itself. Here, it's very, very clear that these people are coming from all over the face of the planet. It says there in verse eight, they come from the four corners of the earth. And they come to join the devil in his rebellion. But the sense here of the mention of Gog and Magog is that those who are going to join with Satan here in his final rebellion against the Lord, they'll be of that very same kind of rebellious spirit as the ancient peoples of Gog and Magog who have forever been enemies of God's people. So they're sort of representative here of all of those people throughout the world who are opposed to the righteous rule of Jesus Christ. 
And so we see here they're going to come in or they're going to lay siege, it says in verse 9, all around the city of Jerusalem. Literally, right? That's the beloved city. That's the city from where Jesus will be ruling and reigning. And they will be deluded into somehow thinking that they will somehow overcome him, only to be overcome themselves, literally, by fire that comes down from heaven. I just think of this whole scene, and it is hard to conceive of how far they really go in their rebellion against the kingdom age. In this time of pure prosperity and of perfect peace, no problems, right? Talk about rebels without a cause, right? Here they will be, they're going to rebel against the Lord at the very first chance that they get. Again, simply confirming the deep depravity of the human heart apart from Jesus. So this is going to answer once for all the nature versus nurture question, right? Is it environment or is it heredity that makes people so fouled up? What the Bible teaches is that we're not sinners because we sin, but that we sin, why? Because we're sinners. Every one of us were born into this world. We were born sinners. No one had to teach us how to sin. Did you ever go to a class on how to sin? Upper division sinning, right? Prerequisite is some easy sins or something. Right? You never had to teach your child how to throw a temper tantrum, right? Okay, Bobby, come here. Here's what we're going to do. It's going to be a very crowded store, <laughs> and, right? And we're going to walk in there. And I want you to just set your mind on something that you want. And I'm going to tell you no. And then you're going to throw yourself to the ground, kick and scream until every eye in the store is on us. And then I'm going to carry you out of the store and strap you back in your car seat, right? No one ever had that conversation with their child because they didn't need to. Because that tendency is already in their nature. And so Satan being let loose here helps prove that out. It answers that question once and for all, that the human heart can't be changed simply by a change, even a perfect change in the environment on the outside. The human heart can only be changed by a spiritual rebirth that happens on the inside. And that's why it is so important for us as Christians to stay on message, especially at this time in human history. And that message is that we need our sinful hearts to be changed. We need to make sure we understand what the problem is and what the symptoms are because of that. The symptoms are many. And we could spend all of our time and our energy trying to address them until we die. And the next generation comes into place and then gets mired down in chasing the same things. What really needs to change in a human life is when God comes into that heart and then gives us a new heart. Right? When that heart is changed, then we start to see that will affect changes in the environment on the outside. These changes to, you know, to what are simply symptoms of the original sickness. So with this final sort of rebellious revolt by Satan, God is now about to wrap up all of human history. There's just one great event that remains. We've had this great coming kingdom. We've had this great final rebellion. And now we're going to see the great white throne in verses 11 through 15. In verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, 
and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now this is truly, it is a great and an awesome scene in the true sense, right, of those words great and awesome. John now sees in the heavenly scene this single white throne, right, a throne of judgment. And it's great because every single person in all of human history who died outside of having a faith in Jesus Christ, every single one of them will stand before this throne. It's great because of the weight of the sentence that's going to be meted out from it. It's white because it represents that unchanging holiness and the purity of God himself who sits upon it. It represents the holiness and the purity of the judgments. However harsh the judgments may seem to us, they are pure and holy that are about to come from that throne. It says that John sees heaven and earth flee away from that throne because there is no place for the lost sinner to hide. And because immediately following this scene of judgment, we're going to see next week that both the heavens and the earth are going to be dissolved. A new heaven and a new earth are going to be created. And understand this, the judge who is seated there on the throne is Jesus. In John chapter 5, he told us himself, he says that the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So today, he is the loving Savior of the world, and yet on that day, he will be the righteous judge. And he's going to judge righteously and without any partiality. He's going to judge in just the same way he has come now to save. Understand, when God saves today, he will save anyone who will believe in his son for the forgiveness of their sins and for their eternal life and their salvation to become that new creation. And he never turns anyone at all away. That's a wonderful thought. In human history, there has never been one sinner, no matter how heinous their sins, whether they have sinned enough for a hundred people, when they have repented of their sins and turned to the Lord and trusted in his son for their forgiveness, he has never turned one single one away. He is completely impartial in his salvation. He is no respecter of persons, is what it says in the old King James. But in just the same way, he is also impartial in his judgment for those who refuse to repent. And they will all stand before this great white throne judgment before him. It says in Hebrews 9 that it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. This is the second resurrection, right? Where death gives up the bodies of the lost, Hades, right, the realm of the spirit, it gives up the souls of those who've died. There will even, it says there, there'll be a resurrection of lost bodies from the sea, right? No one will escape. All of the dead are going to stand before Jesus. And let me be very clear. This is not a trial, right? This isn't a trial to determine whether they are guilty. This is simply a sentencing to their eternal damnation. Because their guilt, they have already determined by their rejection of Jesus Christ. It's heavy, right? I think it's very, very important for us to realize that no one will ever, ever end up in hell because of their sins. No one will ever end up in the eternal lake of fire because they were born a sinner or because they committed certain sins during their life. Everybody's a sinner. 
and everybody doesn't end up in the eternal lake of fire, the reason that people end up in that place of eternal judgment and eternal suffering is because of a failure to do the one great thing that brings forgiveness for my sins, and that is simply to trust in Christ as my Savior, period. In John's gospel account, someone asked this of Jesus. They said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered them and said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. That is how a person gets into heaven for eternity. It's by trusting Christ. It's not my list of lifelong sins that's going to land me in the judgment. It's a lifelong rejection of Jesus as my personal Savior and as the payment for my personal sins. That is the only unforgivable sin in all of the universe. And people get very confused on this and they say, well, what about these books? What about where it says there in verse 12 that the dead were judged according to their works? by the things that were written in the books. Well, the problem is that the part that they missed is just before that, look in verse 12, where it talks about the book of life being opened. And then in verse 15, where we're told without any lack of clarity at all, that anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This book of life is the same as the Lamb's book of life, which we saw back in chapter 13. We're going to see it again next week in chapter 21. And it contains the name of every individual who belongs to God. Every one of us that have attained eternal life because we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Right? That Lamb who's been slain from the foundation of the world has a book in which are recorded all of the names of those who have been redeemed because of his sacrifice. And we will not be standing there at this judgment because our sins have already been judged, where? At the cross. There's no longer any payment that's due from us because Jesus already paid the price for us. Notice in verse 12, John says that I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. So this is a judgment only of those who are still dead in their sins. Now we will stand, even as believers, we will stand before Jesus in judgment. But we're going to do it at a very different ceremony. We're going to do it at what's called the judgment seat of Christ, which Paul talks about in Romans 14. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's the ceremony where we as believers will have our works judged and rewarded based on our faithfulness and our motivation. It's what we talked about before. It's what will determine how it is that we'll be serving the Lord in the coming kingdom. Sometimes you may have heard it called the Bema seat which was the term that they used for the awards ceremony at the Olympic Games, right? Where some might receive more rewards than others, but everyone there, right, we're all winners. We're all winners because we're robed in the righteousness of Jesus. This judgment here at the white throne, not the bima, but the thronos, it is not the same, not in the least bit. There will only be unbelievers and there will be no rewards. There will only be condemnation. And yet, we do get the sense that there will be different degrees of that condemnation. So all at the white throne judgment will be sentenced to eternity in hell. But in the very same way that believers are evaluated individually and are rewarded justly for our individual works, unbelievers here are going to be evaluated individually and they're going to receive a punishment that is completely just. Different degrees of eternal punishment for the wicked based righteously upon their individual wickedness. 
And the whole mention of these books is to say that no one will be able to argue with the Lord or to question his final decision because everything is recorded in these books that are opened. Now, these books, some suggest, could refer to the law of Moses, right? The first five books of the Old Testament. Because it's the law of Moses, the Bible tells us, that exposes every single human being in the world to be a sinner and thus in need of a savior. Remember, Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. He said that by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we read through the law of the Old Testament and it acts like a plumb line. It's a perfectly straight line. It's so right and it's so just and it's so perfect and it's so true. You could take anything else in the world, right? Any human life that you would put up against the purity of that plumb line of the law of Moses and it would simply expose us as crooked, out of plumb. Right? It exposes us as being less than holy, less than straight, less than right. It exposes us as the sinners that we are. And so that's the purpose given behind the, the law of Moses. And these books there in heaven at the judgment would certainly do just that. Now, it's also very possible that these books, as others would suggest that these books are a written record down to the last detail of every person's life. It's heaven's version of a video, right? It's a history of any and every single individual life. And that written record would surely cry out, right? It would be a written testimony against anyone who would claim that this was an unfair judgment. At the first objection, all that Jesus would have to, have to do is simply say, read the book. Open it up. Right? Play the tape. And just let the book be read until that person himself begs for it to be stopped. And I would also suggest to you this morning that that record, of course, it would have to include the same sort of detailed account of each and every time that that person rejected the opportunity to receive Jesus. Each and every time they rejected the opportunity to receive his love and to receive his forgiveness and to receive the payment that he offered to make for their sins on their behalf. And as they understand that and they see him there on his throne in his glory, they will be speechless because they will understand for the very first time that they have rejected something that is absolutely priceless. Here's what the author to the Hebrews says about this. It's a long passage, but it's important. Please don't tune out on this. He writes that if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Right? If we reject Jesus after we know the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for us. Then he goes on to say, look, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. Then he goes on to say that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. None of you need me to spend any more time of our morning talking about just how horrible hell will be. Right? Jesus himself talked about it being a place of outer darkness and of unquenchable fire and of weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place of complete isolation 
of constant torment and regret and sorrow. And I also will not stand here and tell you that it won't be that bad because it will be that bad. It will be worse than we can even imagine. I'm not going to stand here. I'm not going to tell you that it's not eternal because it is eternal. Notice just from our text that as Satan is cast into the lake of fire back in verse 10, it says he was going to join both the Antichrist and the false prophet who had already been suffering at that point for a thousand years. There is no such thing as annihilation, as some people would teach. One does not simply cease to exist in hell after some arbitrary amount of punishment. The Bible speaks nothing of that. So the, the sad reality is that there is no escape from hell once you are there. It is a place of eternal torment, day and night, forever and ever. And if you are here this morning, if you are listening today and you are not born again by the Holy Spirit, if you have never trusted in Christ as your Savior, then you need to do that. You need to do it so that your name can be found in the book of life so that when you die, you'll go to heaven and you will not spend eternity separated from God suffering in hell because there is no need for you to end up in that place. Listen very closely to me. If you are not yet saved, the thing to realize about the lake of fire is that it is completely, it is completely avoidable. Standing here at the white throne judgment, facing this kind of eternal sentence is the most avoidable thing in your life. It is more avoidable than taxes, right? It is more avoidable than illness or than aging. It's more avoidable than allergies, right? Any of these things that we can't avoid Everyone can avoid this judgment for their sins by simple faith in the work of Jesus on the cross for the forgiveness of those sins. And then our life and our name is written there in the book of life. And it is just that simple. It is as simple as John 3.16. It really is. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I pray that everyone who hears my words this morning would believe in that powerful name of Jesus Christ as their savior. So that this scene and this fate of eternity doesn't have to be part of any of our futures. God doesn't want anyone in that place I don't want you to be in that place. We don't want you to be in that place. You don't want to be in that place. And there is no need for you to be in that place because it is the most avoidable thing in this life. This is real. This is the future of the world. This is the future of our eternity. And the tough thing about being a pastor and teaching these kinds of things from this book is that you have to teach these things in this book. Because at the end of this book, there's this little warning that the Holy Spirit gives. In chapter 22 and verse 18, we will get there. It says that everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things... God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So I need to be very, very clear. Right? I need to be squeaky clean as we go through these kinds of things. And just be faithful to deliver the message and then leave it with the Holy Spirit. And just to trust him to draw us into that relationship with him. Now, as we close, for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, I have a word of great encouragement for you guys as we finish up this morning. If your name is already written in the Lamb's Book of Life, can I encourage you? that your name is the only thing that's written there? 
We have no indication anywhere in the scriptures that there is any record kept in heaven of any wrongdoing, past, present, or future, of anyone who has placed their faith and put their trust in Jesus Christ. There are no detailed accounts. There are no hidden recordings because they've all been covered over by the blood of Jesus. Right? That law which would surely convict us. Right? Our own actions which we know would convict us. Paul writes in Colossians 2, he says that you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses and having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All of that stuff, nailed to the cross, never to be brought up again. And that is something that we can rejoice about. That is something that we will be eternally thankful for. And it's something even now, as we go to this time of communion, it's something that we can remember, it's something that we can meditate upon, it's something that we can give him praise for as we remember his sacrifice. So as the worship team comes back up, we have here at Calvary Chapel what we call open communion, which means that it's open to anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're visiting us from another church, if you haven't yet had your membership paper sent over, that's okay. Okay. Right? We don't have membership here. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you've placed your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins, then you are part of our family and you are welcome to celebrate his work on the cross on your behalf. Now, if you haven't yet made a commitment to Christ, then communion really isn't for you. Because it celebrates that work and it celebrates... The, the work that he did on the cross on your behalf. Now, if you would like to celebrate that with us, you can put your faith in him even now today. And you can partake of communion as a way of thanksgiving for what he's done. So what I'm going to ask is that as the worship team starts to play and starts to minister, the communion elements are up here on these two tables. You're welcome to come forward to pick up the, the elements and take them back to your seat. Take them on your own as you've prayed and, and thought as between you and the Lord. And when you're ready, you take the communion. If you would like to make that personal commitment to Jesus Christ for the first time today, you can come and you can talk to Pastor Jeff. You can talk to Anne. Ladies, you can talk to Michelle. If anyone... You know, come grab me. We want to help explain this to you and get you started on that path of walking with him so that the first half of the chapter can be your reality and not the second half. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, even for a chapter like today, Lord, so difficult so difficult to read, Lord, so difficult to conceive of an eternity separated from you, Father. But we entrust your word to the ministry of your spirit, Lord. We pray that he would be working in hearts even now to draw people unto you. Father, we pray for those of us who do know you, that you would make this an especially special time of communion, Lord, as we just remember the priceless gift that was paid so that we could be together with you for eternity, Lord, so that we could partake of that blessing of the first resurrection and partake of the blessings of the coming millennial kingdom. And so we thank you, Lord. We pray that you would bless this time of communion even now. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.